Welcome to this edition of Clinical Clips, an accredited continuing education activity. This brief expert video will spotlight the daily hot topics from the conference. Hi, I'm Paul Sachs. I'm Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And welcome to Clinical Clips from the 2024 AIDS Conference. This is day one of four. Now, the first study I want to cover is looking at HIV RNA or HIV viral load as a screening test for people on cabotegravir PrEP. Now, this was a uh, study done in the context of the open label extension of HPTN 083, which is, of course, the pivotal study that showed that cabotegravir was very effective, superior to TDFFTC in prevention of HIV among um, mostly um, MSM as well as trans women. Now, in that study, they showed retrospectively that if you used HIV RNA, uh, you could actually diagnose people who acquired HIV more rapidly uh, than if you just used the usual screening tests, which either are rapid tests or an antigen antibody test. So they then tested this as a testing strategy in the open label extension, and they had over 2,600 participants and they had both uh, at entry, they, they tested them with HIV RNA, and then they also tested them each subsequent visit. And this generated a staggering number of tests, a 26,000 plus tests of HIV RNA. And in that group, in that group, 27 were positive with no other test positive. That means just an isolated HIV RNA. And they looked at that group of 27 tests and they found that 22 actually were adjudicated as false positives and five as true positives. So this uh, led, if you do the math, to an overall predictive positive value of 18.5% and only 9.1% if someone had been adherent to taking their cabotegravir or even had received a dose within that previous six months. So the bottom line here is that this is not a very good test in terms of predicting HIV in people on cabotegravir PrEP. So I contacted the lead author of the study, Dr. Rafi Landovitz, who I know well, and he said the bottom line is if you get an isolated positive HIV RNA in someone on cabotegravir PrEP, just repeat it because most of them, if false positives, are going to be negative. Um, the other thing that uh, I can sort of contextualize is that now that this is in the guidelines, I think it's time to seriously reconsider that recommendation, especially for people who are adherent to cabotegravir PrEP, because it's most likely just going to cause confusion. So where would I use HIV RNA in people uh, starting or on PrEP? I would use it at the beginning, especially if you have any concerns about risk exposures. I would also consider using it for people who had not taken their cabotegravir PrEP in the previous six months. So that's an important study that has uh, very, uh, I think, critical clinical imp implications for those of us following people on cabotegravir PrEP. Since I'm on the topic of PrEP, let me stay with uh, HPTN 083 and discuss just what the global experience was with the open label extension. And I'm really just going to focus on one aspect of it, which is that participants were given the choice of whether to go on cabotegravir or TDFFTC at the end of the study. And remarkably, 96% of participants in the open label extension chose cabotegravir over oral TDFFTC. So why am I highlighting this result? Well, uh, as you, I mentioned already, this has been shown to be superior to oral PrEP, and 96% of people offered this in the clinical trial wanted to continue it. And yet when you look at the rollout of cabotegravir PrEP, in the United States at least, it's actually way, way lower than you'd expect from these results. In fact, uh, somebody told me that it's actually in the single digits of total people on PrEP. And this shows that the implementation aspects of pre-exposure prophylaxis are in some ways as, if not more important, uh, than patient preference and effectiveness. So I'm going to stay with long-acting injectables and start talking about now treatment rather than prevention. And of course, the long-acting injectable that's most widely used for treatment is cabotegravir or pivirine. I'm going to highlight the BEYOND study, which I believe is a nicely done prospective cohort study of people starting uh, cabopivirine in clinical practice. And they measured in one, one uh, 
um, poster, they measured the effectiveness and the other poster, the patient purported outcomes. And what they found is over a 12 month period that the effectiveness was very similar to the clinical trials. Now, the key thing to focus on um, in anyone uh, going on capropivirine is that even though it's quote, non-inferior in the comparative clinical trials, the virologic failure rate with resistance is somewhat higher. So in the clinical trials, about 1%. In this prospective cohort study, about 2%. And conversations with my colleagues around the country and around the world find that it is around 1% to 2%, even for people adherent to therapy. Now, the patient reported outcomes are very, very positive, and that's actually in some ways a self-fulfilling self prophecy, but in other ways very reassuring. So what this uh, tells us is that for people who want to go on, pre on uh, long-acting injectable therapy, who actually really want this, say they really want it, if they are then put on this treatment, they really, really like it. Practically all the measures of uh, subjective experiences with treatment are better than when they were on oral ART. Okay, the last study I wanna to highlight today is on a complication of HIV, and that is uh, anal cancer. Uh, now we know from the ANCHOR trial that uh, treatment of high-grade uh, squamous intraepithelial lesions, or HCL, is, is associated with a reduced incidence of anal cancer. And the results of that study led to a change in guidelines. And you might've noticed that the most recent opportunistic infection guidelines uh, now actually uh, refer to the, the uh, sort of anal, anal neoplasia guidelines that we should be screening for this condition. And they list five screening strategies. One is just to do cytology. The other is to do cytology with some combination with, with a high risk HPV testing. Uh, and the other is to just to do HPV testing. So there are five different potential strategies you can use. And what this group from uh, Mount Sinai did is that they have a very established program for anal cancer screening. And they looked at over 1,600 people with HIV over a, a good long period, a seven year period, and sort of calculated using the uh, biopsy proven HCIL as a endpoint, they calculated the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and the number of HRE, HRA referrals they got based on these different strategies. And the reason why that's important is because even at a place like Sinai, which has a very uh, established HRE uh, program, this is a limited resource. Uh, there aren't enough people trained in high resolution endoscopy for everyone to get referred. And what they found is that while HPV testing, high risk HPV testing was the most sensitive approach, it actually had a, a very low uh, positive predictive value with only 49%. So that means more than half the people referred for high resolution endoscopy would not have H cell at all. So if you combine that though with cytology in some fashion, uh, then you end up improving the test performance and don't sacrifice much in the way of uh, sensitivity. And then he concluded that this was the most efficient way to move forward. And I think most people who have access to HRA are using a combination of high risk HPV testing plus cytology to make the adjudication. So thanks for joining us for day one. Uh, please refer to the landing page for the slides from today's presentations and to claim your continuing medical education credit. And please be sure to come back tomorrow for our second clinical clip from the 2024 AIDS conference here in Munich, Germany. Thanks for listening. We hope you found this activity useful and educational. To receive continuing education credit and to download your printable certificate, please return to the activity webpage and click on the Claim Credit button associated with today's clinical clip.